Chasing the Racing. Powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles. Three, two, one, and welcome back to Chasing the Racing, episode 163. And we're delighted to be joined by one of the most successful BSB riders in history. Welcome to the podcast, John Reynolds. How's it going? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Does that still put a smile on your face when you heard that? Because I just saw your eye going, yes, I am. <laughs> I am still the top man. No, yeah. no, it's been a long, long time now, hasn't it? But uh, uh, yeah, we had we had a moments, yeah, for sure. It's uh, we're, Obviously, we're just talking about in the garden there, but for your... Uh, well, the the year that you won in two thousand and four overlaps with my f- uh, first experiences of BSB. So, f- get obviously watching on TV, and then uh, I think we came down to Brands Indy, and always used to go to Croft with Croft being our local circuit. Uh, but yeah, it's um, in my head, I've got like very fond memories of those sort of days, and like you won the number one on the. I, for me, that's like one of the best looking bikes ever, the Rizla Suzuki. Uh, I used to absolutely love it, but yeah, we'll get into all of that. But did uh, I get just, you in the smoking, by the way? No, I just want to talk about <laughs> advertising for a little bit. You yeah, know, Rizla, no, like Rizla papers and stuff like that. I'm just singing. Did he have a sudden urge to take up smoking? No, Chris, he obviously me, following John me. for years. That wasn't the plan. <laughs> <laughs> but um, just to start off with, just having a quick look at uh, uh, like your history and whatever, and had a quick flick through your book there. And uh, I, it appears that you, you, you're from good stock up in the northeast. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. In fact, we were just talking about that. Yeah, my, my father was from from, from uh, well from Pegswood uh, and Morton near Morpeth, and uh, I've still got family up there now. So um, yeah, we uh, we used to go up as as a kid. In fact, that's one of the first places I started to ride a motorbike was on the uh, on the seafront on the on the sands of uh, what would it be? Uh, Blythe was it? Oh yes, yeah, on the on the seafront there. And, on the sand, it was great. I, I highly recommend you don't do that now solely because some kid will push you off your bike right. and run off with it. It's oh. getting a little bit rougher <laughs> up there now. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to get kicked in next uh, time I go through life. Now. Were you born up that way? Or... No, no, I'm born in, born in Nottingham. Right, and always yeah. stayed around here. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh, Robin Hood country, Robin Hood mm-hmm. country. <laughs> and uh, your dad also used to race as well, didn't he? He did, yes. Uh, just after the war, he, uh, he did sand racing. Um then he did a bit of road racing, then he hurt himself, and then he was off work, and then he had to retire, really. But uh, but his brother, Uncle Tom, uh, sadly passed away last year, but uh, he was Scottish motocross champion back in the day. So it's it's in the blood, it must be, eh? When, when you say road racing, do you mean, like, sort of TT stuff? Or no, you no. Tarmac racing? Tarmac like, racing, yeah, yeah. like, short circuit racing. Uh-huh. And, mm-hmm. uh, and from having the go, like, on little bikes when you were younger, did w- at what point did you start racing? I was eight when I first started. <clears throat> I had a bike at the age of seven, a little under under 50, and uh, learned to ride that. But always, always wanted to go racing, and uh, I managed to persuade mum and dad to, to build a bike for me. And uh, because you couldn't buy motocross bikes back in the day, you know, you had to build them yourself. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Well, it was a long, long time ago now. <laughs> Are you looking at me? Uh, no, no, you're no, taking no, a mickey now, aren't no, you? No, 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 taking a mickey. No, generally, I'll tell you what, that's never even crossed my mind at all, that. I just generally thought, like, it's everything so now, you can get yeah. everything made for purpose, can't you? There's not many things you build at all mm. now, period. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. I just thought there was a market for, like, scrambling's been around before, well, not before time. Oh, there's a question. Oh, Chicken yeah. or the egg. What came first? Surely scrambling came first before road, like, tarmac racing. I would say so, yeah. It would have to be, because it was definitely, <clears throat> tar- like, grass before well, think, tarmac. <laughs> I think Cadwell Park was a motocross track before it was a road racing circuit. So, yeah. <laughs> that, that, oh, uh, I, did, I say, don't quote me on that. That's what oh. I'm saying now, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure that was the Documented case. Documented everywhere, right, John. Right. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Yeah, you used to have a world championship there back in the day. Wow. In, yeah. Do you know what year? This is pub. Oh, it'd be, be in the 50s, I think. <laughs> right. Yeah. Do you know a guy Martin's recent, oh, say recently, like within the last year or so, has bought a, a very good motocross track just down the road from Cadwell. And uh, he's looking to cr- create like a world class uh, motocross venue there. I don't know how they're getting on with that, but. Fantastic. Well, that would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. it really would. It's just in the valley. Uh-huh. I, I forgot the name of the track. It would be in the walls there somewhere, wouldn't Thor, it? Thor's Way MX. But is it? It's, it goes by a different name. I can't remember the other one, but it is called, or the old track was called Thor's Way MX. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, I mean, I've seen videos and stuff. It looks awesome, like really oh, good. Yeah. We, we, did you get into motocross before tarmac or? Oh yes. Yeah. Yeah, I was eight year old uh, when I first started uh, called scrambling. Then by the by the way, no, it all started. I went around the back of the garage, and I found a little petrol tank. And this was when I was about six and a half, seven year old. And I came into to dad and said, 
is this the part of my bike then that you're going to build me? <laughs> and that was the start of it. And simply as I, I think they realised just how keen I was. But yes, I uh, started uh, scrambling and uh, became British champion when I was 12, 13 in the intermediate class. And uh, uh, all my heroes were, were road racers, to be fair, apart from Roger De Costa, who was a world champion motocross uh, rider. Um, uh, but yeah, I really wanted to be a world champion at something, but uh, I realised I was never going to be a world champion at motocross or scrambling. So, uh, <laughs> where, where, why why is that then? At what age was that more importantly? Oh, I'd be about sixteen, seventeen. If you don't mind me asking, what like at sixteen, it's it's mad, isn't it? Because you get on a bike and you love it, and you you go race and your dad and everything. So at sixteen, what specifically at that moment? I'm not going to be a world champion at this. What what was that? If you don't mind me asking, I raced against a guy called Dave Thorpe. Ah, yeah, you yeah, drove right. it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I saw him for about 250 yards on the track, and after that, he'd just gone. And, you know, he, he was something special. Went on to be three or four times world champion, 500, you know, proper, proper nice guy as well. And, uh, yeah, I mean, to, to win a world championship, you had to be as good as he is. And that was nothing like that. So um, there you go. And Did is you know, that, it was at that realisation that you thought, well, I'll, I'll try something else then? Oh, well, not really, no. I mean, I just carried on plodding away, enjoying motocross, because I was like you and you, Dan, just Dom, sorry. Love, love I prefer most. Dan, to be fair, yeah. actually. <laughs> oh, actually, I, just, I didn't correct you there, thinking, I actually prefer that. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I just love riding motorbikes, and that was that was all it was, really. But um, actually, my actual passion was, was road racing. Right. So my biggest hero was Barry Sheen, and uh... we see like what, what like what we have as you know like we have like the mini bike thing, and the, obviously even like people even skip motocross now and go straight in the tarmac. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't even remotely accessible then. Is that is that correct in saying? It was for, it... for youngsters back in the day, yeah, you couldn't go. I think ride a road racing bike until you're sixteen, seventeen, right? Probably older than that, maybe. Uh, so it was never an option, and not only that, I mean it's just the expense of it all. Mm. You know, back in the day, I think a TZ two fifty in the early 80s was about £25,000. Well, you know, you could buy, buy a house for that back in the day, so it was just totally off my radar, if you like. Jesus, mm. wet. Mm. You're, not, you're not going with a TZ tank to your dad and just <laughs> go like, this is the beginning we, of my TZ 350. No, <laughs> we could never afford anything like that. And what was the crossover to road racing? Well, I, I, I finished motocrossing, Right, and uh, we had a couple of years off, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do because I wanted to road race, but couldn't afford to. Mm. And then uh, my dad went to a vintage uh, race meeting one day, and he came back, and we, we started talking about it. Then it was like a, a light bulb moment. Boom! We've got a, a Velocet 250 MOV 1934 in the garage that Dad used to race just after the war, but he never sold it; he just kept it in the garage. And uh, I, I said to my dad, so, can we not get this bike built and go racing? Well, of course, all hell bro- broke loose. Mum left home. She said, no way am I going to go road racing. And uh, anyway, I managed to talk Dad around it, and uh, we built this little bike back up again. But unfortunately, when Dad was racing, he um, he modified the bike. It was obviously a standard, a, a solid frame, no suspension, apart from the front end. And no, no suspension on the rear. My dad was a, a, a great engineer and uh, he decided to put a cantilever back end on this bike. So it meant chopping the back off, put a swing arm on, and then the suspension and everything. But unfortunately, he never took a photograph of it. So we went to see the vintage people and said, well, This is the bike. Can we run it as it is? And they said, Well, if you can prove that this bike was run like that back in the day, you know, you can, you can do it. No photographs, nothing. We couldn't do it. So. He had to chop all the suspension off and then put a solid frame, a rigid uh, suspension back on again. And uh, we started from there. But that's how it all started, just vintage racing, really. And this was, were you about 17, 18? No, 20, 21. Wow. Oh, that was a late starter. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but was your dad not, did your dad have a spin on it after all that engineering No, never did. No, oh, that no, must have killed no, him yeah, inside, yeah. that. Yeah. Why on it? <laughs> like no, the... he, he just enjoyed watching me, I think. Yeah. It's so, mad, it's mad known to today's world when you know the, we've, you've got like kids of like twelve and thirteen racing Grand Prix level. It's, <laughs> it's mad to think mm. that you know. I mean, if someone came to you now who was twenty two and said, "Ah, oh, quite fancy going racing," you'd just kind of think, "Well, it's impossible." You isn't know it, what? Now? I just had this conversation yesterday with somebody else all about asking me about the age and that, and I'd said if I'd gone and asked myself back in the day, 
you know, what about racing? I'd have said, forget it. You're too old, you know. It's but, bad, uh, isn't it? Yeah. But having said that, I'd spent most of my life racing anyway, you know, from the age of eight. So I, I'd got a rough idea of how the racing thing works. And, uh, and I honestly believe that riding a motocross bike is the best uh, grounding for any road racer, really. Purely because you, you ride a bike in all situations, the bike's always out of shape, or most of the time anyway, and it becomes second nature. Um, mm. So, you know, if, if somebody came to me and said, what's the best way to start road racing? I'll say motocross first, have a couple of years at that, learn your trade, and then go on to road racing. I, I tell you what, we've we've always got a daft question on the show. We've got a term mm. called motocross dad. You know, when like dads are shouting at their kids. What, what was your old man like with you then? I never did. No, no never. No, no. Right? No. Um, in fact, there was one particular time when I was riding uh, a 600 in a in the British Championship. The first round I went to, I was I was a second off the pace, but ended up 20th. And on the way home, I said to my dad, I said, I don't think I'm cut out for this, you know. And that's the first time he actually gave me some encouragement. He said, just stick at it, you'll be all right. But he never, ever shouted at me and never said, you, you know, I'm a waster. He always gave me encouragement, so... And that's, you know, you can't knock that, can you? No. Yeah. And so uh, on the bike that you started the tarmac racing with, was that some sort of, I mean, was that some sort of like classic racing that you started? Uh, vintage. Or that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's 90... classic then vintage, Chris. You know? then from, from, <laughs> so what sort of year would that have been like the when you when you started racing? like 87. 87, and this bike was a 30, 34. The 30s. Wow, okay, 1934, yeah. Yeah, so a good chunk of time after. Oh, yeah. Um in today's world that would be like riding a sort of a 70s bike in it mm-hmm. like a 1970 mm-hmm. a bike built in the 1970s Dom actually races quite a lot of classic racing oh yeah like yeah. the classic TT mm-hmm. and all mm-hmm. of never the... a Valiset though <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'm not man enough for one of those what, def- the bikes you ride what sort of era are those from oh 80s 80s, 80s. so like sit like um Oh, like inline four Honda replica, like yeah. Hailwood replicas, and right. oh, like yeah, yeah. beautiful things. And like a best bike I rode is a seven R and a G fifty. Oh, they're beautiful, mm-hmm. like AGS bikes. You know, yeah, they're just yeah. it's but mad they, how there's a the generation there but, difference that like the bikes that were sort of new and state of the art. As Dom's now racing as mm-hmm. classic bikes. Yeah, it's mad, isn't it? it? But the mad yeah. thing is, they're like the br- they get, they're not like your Val- your dad's Valiset was a proper like that was built from the shop stored everything that was what i would class as a proper classic bike now like the bikes i race for the davies lot are, they're brand new every year they're brand mm-hmm. new the frames are brand new the wheels mm-hmm. are brand new that the replicas yeah. you know what i mean so they they can do the job at high speeds now but like yeah, I say, like, it, yeah. it's long gone of the days of being able to pull out your bike out the shed and go racing on it it just doesn't mm-hmm. like, it, that doesn't exist anymore it's like your comment about you were saying like 21 22 if you just started into it you're like oh, you're wasting it you're wasting your time to get to that level it's mm-hmm. it's ridiculous isn't it and things so, move forward so from uh, from the vintage side of things what was the i mean i presume you did well on that and that, then did you someone get noticed or was it a case of you and your dad decided to go like modern day racing mm-hmm. or how did yeah we did uh i think three races the fourth race we did was at snetterton and uh in qualifying on the Saturday, I think we went three laps and the, the bike just blew itself apart. It's uh, the crank broke and it just exploded. And you know, obviously, we we're all disappointed. We didn't race, we came home, and that was that. But then dad said, Look, if you're that keen, I'll lend you the money to go and buy a LC350 and then let's you know go and do the job properly. You know, I think he saw that I had something about me. You know, when I started, uh, I started off with this fella set. And it was slow. Dad got it stronger and stronger, and I got quicker and quicker, race by race, and ended up winning on the I think the third time out. So you could see there's a bit of potential there. I, t- I tell you, what, I, m- I must say, you know, it's if like I've only just met you, but you've got a really calm demeanour. It's it's what was your attitude like then? Was it when you were getting on a bike, even the velocity, it was like I'm going to have to try and win this, or was it let's just try and build into it? Or what was your mindset at that point? I had a game plan. <laughs> yeah, we've got to talk me through and, this gear well, plan, I must know. <laughs> I wanted to make a living out of racing motorbikes. Right, right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I say one of my heroes was Barry Sheen. The other one was Ron Haslam. Okay. Now, lucky enough, Ron Haslam lives about 10 miles away from me. Was that uh, while growing up as well? Yes. Oh, yeah, right, but, I I, but I I never met him uh, up until... Well, I, the only time I saw him, I was on the back of a... Uh, a friend of mine had bought CBX Honda. Do you remember them? 600 yeah, yeah. Hondas, right? And we've gone down the bypass. 
turned off at Langley Mill just as Ron Haslam came past us in a scimitar, an old, you know, old sports car. And uh, so that's the, that's the first time I really met him out of racing, if you like, but just yeah. waved to him and he waved back, obviously, because it was the first time that they, we'd probably seen a CBX on the road because it was a, one of the first times, one yeah. of the first bikes out there. So, uh, but anyway, a builder friend of mine, when I was motocrossing, I said I wanted to go road racing and he said, well, I know Ron Haslam. Oh, you're joking, dear. So you couldn't get me a, a meeting with him, just go and see what's the best thing to do and how to start up. He said, yeah, well, I'll ask him, yeah. So um, anyway, it turned out that he said, uh, yeah, Ron, we'll have, he'll have a, have a word with you. So go and see him uh, Saturday afternoon. So I went round and the, Ron and Anne were sitting around the kitchen having a bag of chips and uh, I sat down and had a chat with him and that's how it all started, really. Then Ron sort of took me under his wing slightly um in fact he said we we're testing next week with john gainey it was one of his nephews and he said uh going to donington do you fancy coming i said yeah yeah i'd love to so i went down there and uh i didn't take anything with me a proper set of leathers i didn't have a helmet i thought i'll just take a set of leathers just in case you never know anyway he said uh, right come on then john let's see what you're made of see if you see what you what you like on so he gave me this little i think one two five it wasn't a proper race bike, but it was a little road bike with the drop handlebars and a fairing. So he said, uh, you you go around, then I'll follow you around and then see where we're at. So I thought, well, this is it then. <laughs> I've got to impress him. So I just went flat out. Anyway, I ended up crashing on the third lap. <laughs> <laughs> at coppice. I went over the top of the hill and washed the front end out. And you can imagine how embarrassing that was, really. Not only that, Ron had lent me a helmet. Yeah, and of course smashed it up. It all scratched. Oh, dear. So I thought well, that's it. He's, he's finished with me. He's got to. But anyway, it turned out that uh, the builder friend, uh, when he got back, he said, how did John go today? He said, well, if he doesn't crash his brains out, he's going to be a good little rider. So, but well, that was the start, really, of Ron and Anne mentoring me, if you like, to, to start road racing properly. And uh, they've been fantastic friends ever since, really. Yeah. Would you pass that advice on? Get the lap three, you know, chuck it up the road, impress uh, <laughs> no, that's what... John Rails, you know, I'm just wondering how many people listen to this going, this is how you do it, kids. <laughs> well, that's, it. that's the first thing I do when, if ever anybody wants to come around with me on a, on a Babak, whatever you do, I say, don't try and impress me, just do your own thing. But then we've got Chrissy Rouse here, haven't we? <laughs> I'm glad you brought this up. Yeah, a right. little fan girl moment. Yeah. Who wants to tell the story first? Go on, you go. Well, I was, I was at a track day at Silverstone and, uh, this guy came up to me and said, excuse me, you wouldn't mind following my lad around, would you, just to see if, you know, you give him any, any tips? So, yeah, yeah, I'd love to, yeah. So I got introduced to Chrissy and uh, we got out pit lane and within two laps he'd gone, disappeared. So I came back into the pits, and which turned out to be your dad. Who said, is that? Well, I've been wondering. Who is that? Is it Martin? <laughs> is it that? <laughs> You'd be laughing. Oh, You'd be the only okay. one laughing at that one. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> And I, I said, honestly, there's nothing I can teach him. You know, he's he's there, he's, he's on it. And uh, you could probably teach me a thing or two, actually. So, um, oh. yeah, that was the first time I met you. You'd have been, been about 16 then, wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, I was, yeah. It was mm. for, uh, just got us onto a 600 from a 125. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a, a real sort of special moment for me because, like I'd said earlier, when I first started watching, getting introduced to the sport, you were the top man at the time. And then to I remember um, walking down pit lane and seeing you as an instructor and, like, almost being <laughs> like... The, it, just impressed to see you but then to go out on track and for that to happen that was um, mad, isn't it? yeah but I, I do remember you, you didn't have tie all on so <laughs> oh, right. okay. yeah. Yeah. in all fairness no but, thank you for that you know you've been too kind but uh, <laughs> no you, we could see there was something quite special there couldn't we uh, but uh, yeah and I, to be honest I was amazed you could remember that I said on the way down to Dom I said oh this happened but like you definitely mm. won't remember so yeah oh yeah no I do yeah mm. and, um, and to be fair to be fair this isn't planted at all it was literally within seconds of walking through the gate I thought, I can't believe this. <laughs> I'm surprised you could fit in the studio, Chrissy. I saw your head inflate. Try I'm joking with you. I'm joking with you. So we've got um, the little introduction to on on that bike with Ron. And then was it a case of, did you and your dad race the 350 with like a little bit of guidance from Ron? In yes, days? exactly that, yeah. And uh -huh. I presume you took to that well and started winning at sort of club level, was it? Yeah, First? club level, that's right, yeah. And then, uh, then what happened, uh, a guy called Vic Lamb, Right, and I, I, raced, I raced for him. He was a Kawasaki uh, dealership back in the day in Louth. And uh, I used to say so motocross, I rode for Vic. So I knew him, and he knew Alec Wright, 
which is Colin Wright's uh, Dad's son. Dad's son. Mm-hmm. Dad. And uh, so th- there's a bit of a tie-up there. Anyway, we, uh, I was at uh, Cadwell Park, and Vic came across and said hello, and we started chatting. Mm. And he said, uh, actually, I know somebody who's got a TZ350, that the rider he's got now is retiring, and he's looking for a rider to ride it. So would you fancy it? I'll put your name forward. I said, oh, God, yeah, proper race bike. You know what I mean? I'd only been, race, I'd been, only been racing about six months, so... Very, very lucky I got. Bloody anyway, so this guy called Barry Cox had phoned me up and said, uh, I've been passed, your name's been passed on to me by Vic Lamb. He said, uh, I'd like to come and see you and say hello. And uh, if I like you, then there's going to be a bike here for you. And that's how that started, really. So I got onto a 350 and uh, raced that the next year. Is this um, at the equivalent of BSB sort of level? It was at the ACU, British Championship, mm. uh, which he ended up winning that year. So. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was uh, quite a special moment. It really was. I got, I'm, I'm trying to think of a great way to word this question, and I normally never do. So I'm just trying to think, you know, was this going all to plan? You know, he was saying, I had a plan, I want to become a professional rider. And at that point, was it easy for you? Like, just winning these races? No, or no. was it... Because we always discuss it on the show, it's about, like, natural talent and, like, skill set and stuff. Did you believe at that point, I'm better than everyone else? No. Like. Now this is really mm. interesting. So Never. you you felt like yeah you talked me through it. You just generally felt like you had to work for it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, every single time I got on the bike, I wanted to win mm. for sure. And you know, I'll be I'll I'll be feeling ill every time I got on a bike. People used to think I was miserable, you know, but it wasn't. It was because I was serious and I just wanted yeah. the, the, the job in hand. I wanted to win and. Um, so no, I never took anything for granted. Um, I. I just had a plan. I just wanted to win races. And I thought, if I can keep winning, people are going to spot me and the chances are going to come. And I always said, if a chance ever comes up, I'm going to take it, you know, whether it's, I think it's too big a chance or not. And that's, uh, that's really how I, I, I planned it. So that's that year on the 350, can you remember any of your main competitors? Oh, God. Um, nobody you'll know. Right. No. Uh, I'll tell you what, yeah, they would. Steve Hislop. Uh, there's a name. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was only there for a couple of races, but yeah, Steve Hislop was wow. uh, back in the day. And from the 350 wow. back then, what was the natural step after that? Well, again, this guy called Vic Lamb. I was racing at Cadwell Park, and uh, this was a British Championship event. And uh, there was uh, Kawasaki were there, Team Green Kawasaki, and that was with... Uh, Roger Hurst in race one. Okay, well, Roger, I think, hurt himself in the morning of the practice day. So Vic, knowing Alec Wright, knowing Colin Wright, phoned up, well, he spoke to, uh, to Colin Wright at the circuit at Cavill, and he said, why don't you put John on the 600, give him a go on it? And he said, oh, I don't know. He said, uh, I'll have to phone my dad. Well, his dad was doing the, the Grand Prix, motocross Grand Prix, so he was in Belgium. So he phoned his dad up and he got back to us and uh, he said, uh, or Vic came over to him and said, uh, Ali Ryan wants a meeting with you. So I went over and uh, he said, right, there's a bike here for you this weekend if you'd like to have a go on it and see, you know, don't do anything daft, just go and enjoy yourself. And I did, I did well. And then I saw, he, he offered me a contract at the end of that year to race for them uh, the year after. It would have been 1989 it would have been, so... Yeah, so, so lucky, you know. The, the, so, oh, 87, did you say? You still got in the tarmac? Yeah. So, in uh, three... <laughs> yeah, I was, I was being paid to ride motorbikes. That is absolutely mad. Wow. But again, this is all down to... That is incredible. I say to Vic Lamb, really, because he, he knew people. And this, this goes back to when people say to me, what's the best thing to do when you start racing? The most important thing is never hack anybody off, you know. if you, In fact, Alec Wright said to me, if you've got nothing good to say about the product, don't say anything at all. And that stuck with me for the, you know, the rest of my career, really. Mm. Um, but, yeah, it just goes to show that, obviously, I had not hacked anybody off in, in Kawasaki, and they offered me a job, and that's how my career started, really. Outstanding. Yeah. What, were you, what were you doing prior to this? You know, like, get, like you know, you're building the bikes with your dad and stuff like that. What When you left school, 
what like were we training up to do anything else as a fallback plan or was it no. sod the fall up but we're going racing oh no it wasn't no no i uh no i just i got a job at philip signs philip signs go, yeah going around in a van putting up for sale boards right right yeah, yeah right so i was 16 i was a driver's mate and all we did all day was flying around the roads in in this van putting up signs and having a good time and i remember one day the, the boss came to me after i've been there for about a year he said uh you know i think you've got a bit more about you than just being the van driver i said do you want to train to be a sign writer i said no nah. i said i'm going to draw myself to what's in these vans i was just turned 17 i got my license and that was it Can you imagine you know driving yeah, somebody yeah. else's car all day long <laughs> flying around the roads it was absolutely brilliant but that lasted about a year and a bit and i thought you know what actually so i went to the boss and said you know that offer about being a sign writer could i, could I do it he said well yeah you can he said i can't afford to pay you now to, to learn but if you want to stay behind it after work an hour a night and learn get to a certain standard and then when you're good enough I'll I'll pay you. Hmm. And that's exactly what it is. So I was a sign writer. Hmm. There we are then. Yeah. Without computers, you know, with a with a brush and a mole stick and everything else. I used to love it. I've just got this great image of you just about to get paid to be a sign writer, then the Kawasaki contract goes in front. No. Do we like that job now? Sod off. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm no. off to play on bikes. No. I'll start three. That, that yeah. is incredible. I, I, was paid by, I was paid to race motorbikes, but I, I didn't pack my job up. I, I carried on working as long as I could, and the boss, uh, uh, Tony Phillips, he was great with me. He had a, a daughter that was a good tennis player, so he knew how sport worked and uh, you know when i said to him i want time off work to to go racing he, he would let me have it fair play yeah i'd have to work saturdays back for it but uh mm. you know you do these things sort of flexible with it so uh that year with the when you were riding for was it so colin wright running the team that team year? team green kawasaki was yeah and in which category is that it was 600 uh super sport right okay and then okay. but they also had uh, formula one and uh super stocks and it was super stock then back in the day, which is like super bike now. Right, okay. Got you. You know your transition between like so you've gone from the single of the Valor set mm -hmm. and then you know, like the two stroke well hold on. Even in the the motocross would have been two stroke yeah, and everything like that. Mm -hmm. Going from that onto the fours, back to twos on the TZs. Mm -hmm. Were you happy on a four stroke or do you miss the two strokes ah, I, love, I love them all yeah they, they, you're not didn't matter to me. normally you can yeah. point someone in a corner and go, I'm a two stroke mm -hmm. man or a four stroke mm -hmm. man but you, that did not phase you at all no, just jumping no. on that and... uh -huh. no yeah. back in the day you had to do that mm. yeah. if you wanted a contract uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and, and the year on the 600 who was you, you who were like the people in the championship back then oh, Brian Morrison uh, Hislop again uh, Stringer Ray Stringer mm -hmm. um, there's some good riders there and how did the the season go for you? Yeah, it went it went okay. The first year it was uh, a big learning curve, and then uh, they they bought a new six hundred out ZZR six hundred, uh, big old bus it was. But um, I went out to down to Bourne End to have a go on the bike, and uh, well, it was a road bike, and it was proper proper nice thing. And I did come back and said to Colin, I said, I could win the championship with this bike. Yeah, oh, what a stupid thing to say, wasn't it? But anyway, we did. It did. Lucky <laughs> it. So uh, it was. Uh, yeah, it was good. And that, how were you relation? How was your relationship with Colin? Uh, we're good friends now. But back in the day, he was a taskmaster. He uh, he just knew all the buttons to press to get me to. He used to make me angry, you know, really hang me off on race day and uh, to get the best out of I, you. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I get on the bike and I will just. All I want to do is smash it. Just you know, I was just so angry. Yeah, really. Most of the time, yeah. Mm. Is there anyone like that now? No, that's no. a genuine open, open question. What, team manager wise? Yeah. No. No. I wouldn't say there's anybody like Colin Wright. No. No. <laughs> He's uh, a proper, proper nice bloke, but yeah, uh, he, he no. just he just ruled with a an iron fist, and he wanted. I mean, he was one of probably one of the most successful managers. Yeah, that's been in British racing. A lot of people mm. from either listening to podcasts or books, or even people we've had on the podcast. A lot of people uh, say Colin like massively got the best out of him, mm. and like really have. I mean, I know Neil Hodgson's won. I know uh, I've heard Leon Haslam talk before. Uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, I, I can't think of the names, but lot, I've heard lots of people say um, how he sort of, like you've just said there about uh, getting you angry whatever it took to get the sort of best out of you mm -hmm. um 
but yeah, like you say, he was very, very successful, especially in the sort of GSC d- days. Um, after winning the British Super Sport, was the did you stay in Super Sport? Or did, was did you then move up to the what is now Superbikes? Yeah, I mean, I actually started with Kawasaki running the uh, the KR1. I know you've got the KR1S, but so uh, we did the championship on that. Then it went on to 600. Then they offered me a chance on the 750, but it was the old bike and it, it was it was hard work. But then they made a modification to it. And uh, one of the last races we did of the year, I think we went to Croft and I managed to give the Nortons a good run for the money and uh, put the bike on the podium. And that then opened, they, they, then they saw uh, that I could ride a super bike properly. So that was an, an offer to uh, to get on the on the super bike and just do a full super bike year. And that was a big turning point. <laughs> Were you intimidated at all at that point with a super bike? Or have you been intimidated with any bike throughout all this? Yeah, yeah. I always respected them because yeah. you know, they do bike back every now and again, don't they? I do remember one, uh, one particular time at Mallory Park and... Uh, I was coming out of Devil's Elbow thinking, what a fantastic job this is. Next minute, boom, <laughs> straight over the handlebars and a big, big crash. And that really brought it home to me that you cannot afford to think of anything else other than what you're actually doing at that particular time. Well, I can't anyway, you know. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty serious stuff. But I love doing what I was doing. But I, I was talking with Neil McKenzie, actually, a couple of years ago. And... It would have been lovely to be like Valentino Rossi, where you can actually enjoy doing what you're doing. The first time I enjoyed doing what I'm doing, it hurt me. You know what I mean? So hmm. it was always dead serious. And uh, Now, that, that's interesting, though, isn't it? It's about like the persona of the thing, isn't it? How much did Rossi actually enjoy it? Oh, right, well. No, no, you know what I mean, though? Mm. Like, that's another sort of thing that, you know, mm. the character that he is and the, the legend that he's become. I wonder how much he actually... It's mad. Even. You know, you've just you've just highlighted yeah. that point because I've done stuff similar. You're like, this is amazing. You miss a break and mark, mm-hmm. or you, you lose concentration, and you're like, whoa, hold on, mm-hmm. hold on. Very like very interesting concept. That how much did he actually enjoy it? We've mm-hmm. talked about it before, as in like you you people say like they enjoy racing. And then you say, well, wh- which part of it do you actually enjoy? And then, because when you break it down, there's no, there's very small amount of time where you actually enjoy the moment. I can nail it. You know what it is? The drive home. After you've done it. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> if it's went well. If, if it went well, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you've qualified pole, you've won two races and got the fastest lap in both, you know, you, you, this, if you could bottle up that feeling that you had, you could sell it and it'll be you'll be a millionaire overnight mm-hmm. i tell you what this like uh, for me that like i know the answer to my own question here but what did you prefer more your first podium or your first win oh i think I win. Mean, if... oh, it's got to be a win mm. Mm. i had a podium pretty quickly oh that's all right for you. that's an easy Sorry, answer for yeah, but the, the, <laughs> the win didn't come that easy yeah, yeah. Because I remember my first book took me it took me forever to do it. I remember right. it was my first third place, and it mm-hmm. was just like wow. And then like the wind's great after that, but like your foot, like just climbing that hill, and you're like, oh, I'm on the podium. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, uh, my first, it took me ages to get a podium or a win, but it was actually the same f- uh, result for me. So I'd, I'd never <laughs> oh, had a third well. or a, before I won. I never had a third or a second. So it was like, yeah, you I'll just always, skipped. You just yeah, skiped I'll, it all. I always, I always remember. <laughs> but I'd been racing for ages, you know, and just been sort of mid pack. And I think part of the reason why it was so so ni- such a nice day and a, a nice emotion is because it was so unexpected. I think if if yeah. If it was, a, but um, speaking of how, how Rossi is, even now that he's retired, he's still absolutely killing it on the merchandise. If you go, if you watch any MotoGP, <laughs> the whole grandstands are still yellow and yellow, and he, it's not like old stock either. He's um, the VR forty six merchandise turned. I think they turned over twenty twenty five million euros last year. It, it's like a massive concern. Even do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's 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 amazing. Like what he's, but like he said, it he's special because he can sort of relax and manages to be himself and be super successful yeah uh, it's yeah very difficult and we we're just talking before it's very difficult on a race weekend when you're like so focused and you've got so much going through your head and then you get interviewed you're not really think you, you can't it's it's almost a distraction like you do you know what i'm saying you i know? do exactly yeah i it's, mean it's like when you sat on the line 
and you've you've got a big race ahead of you and yeah. your people have been shoving microphones in front of you and you've got to talk and and it's easy as someone sat at home thinking oh they're a bit rude or they're a bit mm -hmm. arrogant mm -hmm. or they you know not think much of them as a person but it's it imagine imagine like for someone who's i don't know like a receptionist Make, get as stressed as possible at work and then someone put a, a and ask you a question you'd, you'd just be like oh, piss off sort of thing wouldn't you yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a great image that sorry it is good though mm. Mm. It's, uh, yeah I guess it's, it's you're nice. right you're 100% right in yeah. this sort of atmosphere where you can sort of relax and just talk it's it, mm. you get to know the person a lot more than like say on a, on a grid or whatever um, I, I must ask what was the, what was the most annoying part of racing for you the, the most irritating bit I never was. I didn't think any. There was nothing irritating. Um, <laughs> Just mm, no. If you not could... winning, I think was probably yeah. the worst. Yeah, fair enough. Um, fair enough. No, I don't... no. It's just interesting. You're right though, because you're on the grid. It's part of the job, isn't it? That's the thing. You almost you almost take that out of it because it is part of the job. You're on the grid, and you expect to have a microphone in your face. Mm. But if you could take one little thing away from it, no, because that's part of the job. Yes, and you you just got to live with it. You yes. might not enjoy it, mm. and it might be you know but in your face but at the end of the day if people are interviewing they're interviewing you there's a reason for it because yeah. they want to look, know what you're thinking about and what you how the day's going to go so obviously you're obviously quite successful mm -hmm. so no I, I, that wasn't a big problem i mean I, yeah i didn't enjoy it but um yeah it's part of it yes i it's no it's all it's like I've, even just trying to think of an answer for myself, like you say, it's all just wrapped up in one blanket, isn't it? It's just. When was your your first uh, podium in in what's now BSB? Mm. In what now BSB? Yeah. What did that used to be called? Did you say this? It started well because I was doing. Uh, I did two year Grand Prix, two year World Superbike, then it came back to BSB, and it, I think it was a year into it that the BSB had run. So, uh, I think I can't remember the first podium to be honest with you i'd like to say it's the first one i did <laughs> was it just know. straight back <laughs> so before you got to what's now bsb so was it after the 600 year 600 superbike yeah. oh you went to a superbike well uh, yes I, I rode the superbike in uh 2000 uh 19 not 2000 oh, can me 1992 yeah i won the british championship with that and then i did two year grand prix on a 500 uh yamaha for pagets wow uh Bloody. and then I went into, this is when I befriended a guy called Ben Atkins, who was my best friend ever. And he offered to set a team up around me to go World Superbike in 1995, uh, again on Kawasaki's, and we we did that and had a good year. Um, the year after that, I, I joined Suzuki and did the World Superbike for the factory team. Uh, that didn't work out that well. In the end, it's. Uh, I mean, I loved the job and it was fantastic, and the bike was great. But I didn't do a good enough job for them, and I could see that. Our chances are I was going to get the sack. Mm. So Ben said again. He said, "Look, I'm working with Red Bull. Um, with the chances are we're going to set a team up in England. Uh, would you would you fancy riding?" I said, "Yeah, yeah." And that's how it all started back in the UK uh, with uh, Ducati. Then mm -hmm. and stayed there for four or five years. Yeah, it's it's incredible how normally the pattern is the other way around, isn't it? So people start off British and then go in the worlds and then into the Premier class. So you literally went from <laughs> like mm. from the British at the time to to the Premier class with Clive Padgett. How did you, you can't just skip over that? How did that relationship form? How how did it just offered the chance? That's incredible. So Clive just rang you up and well, we had a chat. Yeah, and he class. said uh, there's <laughs> going to be a bike here for you. Do, you. do you fancy doing it? I thought, God, do I? And I can't believe the first time I went to Australia. I just got married, so the uh, oh, this is the other thing. So I'd walk around the track. This is this is our honeymoon. This is where I took my wife. Shelley. You smooth, oh. charming. Yeah, that's it. I've got a new so, job. Uh, Come with uh, us. Where we're going, <laughs> Miami, uh, things, <laughs> Phillip Island. Uh, no, it actually it was, it was Eastern Creek back right. in the day. So, uh, <laughs> and the best thing was I we just went, walked around the circuit and walking back behind the pits, back up to the garage, and I understood. I said. Barishino. and of course I was too embarrassed to say anything to him and uh, he, he walked past us and then he turned around and said John Reynolds I really fell on the floor never yeah 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 and he, he knew obviously he was a very very clever guy he would do all his homework so he was commentating for Australian television at the time and I actually met my hero you know and he, he had a chat and god what a nice guy he was you know they say never meet your heroes but he was a proper nice guy And anyway so that was that 
And then, of course, uh, lining up on the grid, there's Rainey, Duan, Schwamp, <sighs> all these guys passing me going onto the grid. I mean, I, I think I qualified 10th or 11th, I think. And it, at the premier class oh, in the yeah, world. Mad, this is a, How much <laughs> testing did you get to go yeah, on? Like? I didn't do a lot. didn't do a lot, but... This is like the high siders. Like, you know, you've gone from a lovely, quite borderline team in uh, line four to hopping on a fire-breathing, pelvic-smashing, killing well, machine. there you go. High side moment. Yeah, that was the first race I did. And the first crash I had on it as well. High sided myself, big time. <laughs> and uh, I remember picking myself up. Obviously, you know what it's like. You're dazed, aren't you? You bang your head on the floor. And I look up and all the crowd's there. Yeah, you pommy wanker. And they're chucking bottles at me and all this <laughs> Shut stuff. Shut up, man. Oh, <laughs> mate. I thought, I don't need this. I've just crashed a flipping fire-breathing animal bike. And then I'm getting all this lot. So uh, How close were you to the crowd to hear pommy wanker? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was close enough. <laughs> 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 Uh, <laughs> you wouldn't get that now, would you? <laughs> well, wouldn't you? No, I don't know. That's a damn uh, shame we don't uh, get that now. That's um, proper atmosphere. Oh, cheers, lads. Yeah, yeah that's right. was, was that your, a little bit surreal for you being a, you know, around the likes of the riders you've just yeah. mentioned? I was a bit in awe of what to say, to be honest with you. Yeah. Like sort of pinch me moments. Aye, yeah. But it was... Uh... <laughs> This is the thing, and this what I like. I'm trying like the mindset of it is brilliant. You know, you have this determined goal, and you're very honest about how you, you, you took the job very seriously, and you got nervous about it. You know, sitting on that grid with <laughs> in the world, the best the world is delivering. What was your mindset there? You'll be sick of me asking this question. I think I've asked it five mm. times through this interview. But were you thinking I'm going to do them? No. Or were you thinking get in behind them? Can I get in behind them? You know what? What was going on? I honestly felt it's just a privilege to be on this line oh, looking at all I these bet. people and i never had any idea that i was going to beat them you know what i mean which is not the right idea to go racing with but you know the, the bikes i had the the tires i had were never going to match them and the quality of rider that they were you know i still would never have matched what they are i think the, the, one of the biggest moments of that was uh the the, the music at the beginning you know when you sit on the grid and your helmet's off and then this lady sang the national anthem the australian national anthem then these skydivers are coming out of the sky with his parachutes, and this bloke landed on top of the bloody, um, what do you call it, um, stand, grandstand, <laughs> and fell off it. I thought, oh dear, <laughs> that's a bit unfortunate. And she, she's mid song. Yeah. <laughs> Aye. I think he lived, but it wasn't a great start to the race, you know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> And uh, did he get to meet all of the, the top riders? I think it was a quite, did everyone sort of keep themselves to themselves? Yeah, they they kept themselves to themselves, really. I mean, you'd say hello and you'd have a bit past the time of day, but I can't lie. I mean, they weren't my best mates, you know yeah. what I mean? Did you have any, what, like, what was your best result in them two years? I think it was about a tenth. Right. That's outstanding. Mm. But there's a lot of factory riders out there as well. and. Uh, but... like pe people, people can only dream of that. Like At that point, were you on that grid going, I have... I have made the no. dream is done. No, because I wasn't earning any money. You know what I mean? I was. It was just I was there. I was earning a bit, but it was only through private sponsorship and stuff like that. So yeah. I was living the dream, but not living the dream, if you like. You know, I was, I was pretending to live the dream. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it mm -hmm. does. I. Mm. So Could, oh, it's like a that. hell of a thing to tick off the the bucket My, list. Getting, oh, you know, yeah. like, yeah. But, like people couldn't do that now. Millions of people around the world kind of dreaming to be in the elite class or to be mm. to to sort of do that and go all around the world racing. Um, so was it directly from that you had the opportunity in World Superbikes with Ben Atkins, did you say? Yes. And Ben is, so Paul Bird's ex-father-in-law, is that correct? Yes, yeah. that's right, yeah. And yeah, so like Paul's um, son and daughter, it's their granddad. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so he set the team up for you in... World Superbikes for mm -hmm. two years? One year. One year. And um, how did you have any better success at World Superbikes? Yeah, we, we had a moment, yeah. I had a, had a third at uh, Brands Hatch. On uh, a privateer team? Uh -huh, yeah, I had a third at um, Assen. And uh, I got on the front row qualifying at uh, Ockenheim. Yeah we, yeah, we had a good year. It was, it was all right. That bike was a good bike, though, to be fair. So i just come back from riding for Kawasaki. So I had a couple of um contacts within the, the japanese company so then i put them in touch with ben and ben went over to japan and we got you know it was a good bike it was it's just it's a class isn't it do you do you think that's rep look like you could replicate that now like a privateer team just suddenly turning up and just doing what you did um 
At Worlds. Let's talk Worlds. No, probably not. No way at Worlds mm. now. You couldn't. You could not replicate what you've done. No. Back back then, in terms of uh, the the how big the sport was, what had a bigger following? The GPs mm. or no? World, World, World Superbike back in the day. Yeah, I mean, I think the the GP thing was you know tailing it. Would, you know, the foggy job did a, a great thing for the a World Superbike. Mm. I mean, hundred odd thousand people at Brands Hatch and stuff. It was massive. Mm. It was it was all right. Yeah. And so you only did the one year then and then decided to do BSB? I did one year with uh, Ben and then I, w- I rode for the, the factory Suzuki team in World Superbike for the next year. So that'll be 96. Right. And then back to BSB. Back to BSB, yeah. And then spent the rest of the time in BSB. Oh, cool. So talk us through when you went back to BSB. Obviously, you've been racing at a higher level, so you like came in as one of the top riders. Yeah, and no, that's, the, that's the tricky thing about it, you see. I mean, you see these people a bit like uh well it don't matter anyway but you you go away and ride on the grand prix circuits and world superbike circuits then you come back to england and you go to cadwell park and stuff like that i remember testing so i had done basically four years on the grand prix scene world superbike scene riding all the best tracks in the world and uh when i was riding for the factory suzuki world superbike team we tested at cadwell park for a one-off test i couldn't believe it it's like a goat track, you know what I mean? You, so that's what happens when you've got riders that have been doing World Superbike, come back to the UK and uh, try and... I mean, they might have been winning before they went to World Superbike, but when they come back, it's hard work. That's why, he, uh, you know, Scott Redding, when that's he came back, say, yeah. absolutely impressive. It really was. You know, he dug in, didn't he, to do to do what he did. I didn't think he would, to be fair. I'll tell you what, on that subject, what what is what is Scott how is Scott Redden getting on? Like in Worlds. He's Mass- struggling at the moment. Isn't massively he? struggling, yeah, mm. with the BM. So what what's um but is there a change of contract or is any like in what what's I haven't I've actually heard not much if it's you know a change what I mean of about bike, I think. You know, he's just uh, got off the Ducati where mm. you know that was working for him and he's gone gone to the BMW and uh, for whatever reason, you know, they're not gelled just yet, but I'm mm. I'm sure they will. Hopefully, because what what is I tell you what I'm that far off the pulse at the moment with what's happening with Worlds. Let's talk about that briefly. So it's a bit who's doing what. So is Johnny Van Ray winning it all at the moment? No, well, no, no, he's not no. Right? Oh it's, oh, it's some of the best racing you've ever seen. To be fair, you want to watch it? It's, oh God, I'm uh, always like, I'm always at work. No, I, I, oh, sorry, I, 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 oh no, no, it's great because I end up bunging it all together at the end of the year. It's like my Christmas party for chasing the race. And we're always on the road, but so yeah, talk us through it a bit. So is it like who's who's doing what? And well, Jonathan's there and always there. Yes, um, I. Am. Um, Bautista's very strong. Yes, yeah, good. Bautista. I think Bautista's leading the championship at the yes, moment. He yeah. And then Top Racks had a, in his sort of standards, it's been a steady start the season. But he's not had a win yet, has he? Oh. He did. Did he not get one? No, no, I don't think he. Uh, he might have won one at the last one. I can't remember. Uh, but he was. He's like on a string of sort of seconds, thirds, fourths mm. around that sort of thing. But he did sort of turn the corner at the last round. Right. But yeah, Bautista's, mm. Bautista's looking probably the strongest as, at the moment, I would say. But yeah, it is it is very good racing. And um, while we're on that subject, like what what, what was the crack with this um, Top Racks MotoGP chances? Yamaha dropped a satellite team in MotoGP. I've not heard that one. Yes. Oh, is, that, is that the crack, though? Yeah, they have. Um, so I think there was a small chance that he was going to go to MotoGP with Yamaha, but there's now no seats available. Um, he did test the MotoGP bike the other day with Quattararo. They had like mm. How did he go on with that? Private test. I, nothing got published officially, but I think Quattararo said he's he was very impressive. So, mm-hmm. Which you know he would be. He's a hell of a rider, isn't he? Talented rider. When when you did World Super Bikes, what, who won that? Like the two years that you did it, who were the, like, the top riders and top names in it? Uh, they'd be Carl Fogarty, Aaron Slight, Scott Russell. Um, was Colin Edwards in it that year? Colin right? Edwards, yes, of course, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, the list goes on, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Um, I know you'd been racing in Grand Prix, but even... Even so, stepping up, it's almost across the world to bikes back then. Again, it must have been extra, like cool being with, you know, all the the top names in the world. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. No, not really. I was I was not too uh, phased by any of that. To Did be you fair. just sort of feel like you should be there and you're one of them? Yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. I, I didn't I didn't feel intimidated by any of them. So <laughs> that sounded like a very different, <laughs> like a sh- a different shift, like a shift in mentality from your GP days, where you sort of felt just honoured to be on the grid with them. Yeah, well, to yeah. be world suit of bikes. To I think a lot of it to do was the machinery I was on. I think you resign yourself to the fact with the, not all credit to Pagets, but the the for instance the uh, one of the biggest crashes I ever had was uh, Ockenheim in the Grand Prix and it was 
purely down to the bike not being quick enough and that sounds stupid i know but uh, it was the first year that honda recorded 200 mile an hour and down the, the back straight and it was shinichi shinichi ito who uh, clocked that time and he uh he came past me in, in practice and he decided to do a plug shot just as i was ready to go on to the brake so he passed me down the straight and just sat up but of course i, I came around the corner and there's somebody in my way cruising so I have to let the brakes off, try and move, and then hit the brakes again. And then it, it's, I went into the uh, the gravel trap and it cartwheeled. Oh, God. I remember lying there and my helmet was all, well, my visor was off and everything. I, I was proper beat up. And then I looked and I went like that and I was blind in one eye. I thought, oh, no. And I remember when being carried off to the ambulance and uh, I lay in the back of the ambulance. So I kept covering that eye up like that and I couldn't see anything. And I said to the doctor, I said, I, I can't see out this eye, is it a problem? Hoping he would say, oh, no, you'll be all right. And they said, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see out of one eye, so. <laughs> it, it wasn't ideal. So anyway, I kept doing this. And then I, then I could just see a perforation of light. Anyway, lucky enough, the sight came back. But, God, that was scary. Did you have many big injuries throughout your career? No, not really. Um, I got away with it up until... I had broken collarbones and broken wrists, mm, and yeah. bits and pieces, but nothing too serious that stopped me from racing for, for weeks. Uh, it was the last year I had where the first test we did with Suzuki at uh, Almeria. I had a big crash there, broken my leg in four places. So that was the start of the year. And then the last race I had was at Brands Hatch, and that's where that's finished my career off. When mm. I, I basically hit a wall and broke my neck, back, punctured lung, ribs. It was a pretty big, and there was a turning point. I lay in hospital that, you know, a couple of days after when I was awake and realized what had happened. And it was like a switch. It, I thought, that's it, I finished. And Paul Denning, my team man manager then for Rizla Suzuki came in and started talking about next year. And I said, Paul, I've, I've finished. That's me done. I said, oh no, no, don't, you know, don't rush into it. So no, seriously. Uh, nurse morphine. <laughs> Lots more morphine. Yeah, let, mm. We'll give it ten minutes. Yeah, <laughs> but it was. On, it, yeah, I said no. I said honestly, that's me finished, Paul. So and that was that was hard. I bet. Mm. Mm. But then, How? the more I thought about it, then I thought all the pressure has gone. That's it. Now. I've not got to think about next year. I've retired, and that it was just a massive weight lifted off my shoulders. You know, I spent twenty years being suppressed by pressure. You know what it's like, don't you? You know, you're only as good as your last race. That's what my dad always said to me. And you're always chasing contracts. And you, you, you I, I like a, a nice life where I can plan ahead. Well, in, in bike racing, you can't. No, You've you got can't. a rough idea of what you want to do. But, you know, there's a lot can go wrong when it does. It's, uh, yeah, you're out of a job. And that's just the way it is. And you never got to sort of choose choose when to retire. The, no. the choice was made for you. It was, yeah. And in some ways... Doesn't that a lot of the time happen, though? Yeah, I think so. Mm. That's the trouble. Because the job's such a fantastic job, isn't it? You get paid to go racing motorbikes, yeah. you know, and you're surrounded by great people. And, again... It's one, it's one of those, you know, like, say, if that crash hadn't happened, but mm. as you aged, you, your performance went down slightly, but you were still good enough to be in the mix. And so you weren't winning. You sort of knew you couldn't win, but you were getting paid and you were enjoying it. And then you do another year and you kind of... It's difficult to... to, to I think only individuals know when, the, when it's right for them and it's dif different for everyone. I didn't want to get like that where it tailed off. I was, I was, excuse me, I was competitive all the way up. I mean, I was 42 when I retired, but, you know, I was as fit as I was when I was 20, but I just had to work harder at it, mm -hmm. you know, just training harder and, but I could still ride a motorbike. And, go on, what, what, what's your opinion, you know, when Rossi packed in, you know, like he was like, his last race was like 10th place and stuff like that. What, what's your opinion, like spectating now, you know, like mm -hmm. being through there and being in their situation, looking do you look at riders like that and go, no, keep going if you can? Or do you uh, think, stop think, when you're ahead? I think Valentino, you know, he, he tried, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, and he, he, the last two or three, four years, it started tailing mm. off and the podiums weren't there. And it was hard to watch, to be fair. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it was a massive uh, crowd pleaser and uh, everybody wanted to see him and he was happy at that. So, 
Yeah. And let me throw another example out there, and we'll, we'll talk about your um, your little adventure around the place, the TT, and like like John. Let's let's talk about John McGuinness. You know, do you reckon he should stop, for example? Yeah, hmm. yeah, I do. But you know, you talk to him; he just loves it. He loves it. He loves it. Absolutely. That's the thing. And you can earn a bit of money out of it as well. And uh, you know, he's he's a legend, isn't he? Around oh there? God, I one hundred percent. Yeah, I don't know. It's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, it's an individual thing. It's it got to be, isn't it? I yes. mean, I, I did it once, and uh, it, that was the only time I did it, and that's purely because it scared the living daylights out of me. To be fair, <laughs> right? How, how like what part of your career did you do? Oh, it? early on, yeah, eighty nine, I did it. But right. there were six riders killed that year, and uh, it was. What made you go to the TT at that point? Nothing yes. other than Kawasaki offering me to have a go. Really? Yeah, and I, I used to go as a kid. And uh, I loved it. I loved it. And I always respected and admired people that could do the Isle of Man and stuff. And to be fair, when I was uh, you know, a kid, I sort of, because we used to go there every year with my mum and dad, I used to, I knew from the mountain down to the start line, right? And from the start line towards uh, Balacrane. But then obviously there's a massive gap between that lot, isn't there? So, uh, when I knew I was going to go race in the Isle of Man, I, I went out there in a car and did about 14 or 15 laps over the weekend. I pretty well knew where I was going, and I got the Joey Dunlop V for Victory video that it, back in the day you would we'll put in the machine and watch it. And I sort of knew where I was. Uh, anyway, got on the race bike for the first time, got down Bray Hill, got towards Union Mills, and of course I'd arrived there so fast it would gone boom, and I was lost. And it just spent the rest of the time following the right lines because I didn't know where I was going. You know, there's a lot happening, as you well know. Oh, yeah. The, the TT, and there's a lot of danger, and you know that if you do make a mistake, it can be the last one you do, and all these things were dinging around in my head. So, uh, yeah, I think the defining moment for me, realising that I wasn't going to do a TT again, was uh, Steve Hislop came past me at Begara. <laughs> and Begara is, is a hill down, as you well know. <laughs> And then bottoms out of the bottom, and then off towards Kurt Michael. And he came past me uh, like three times faster than I was going. I thought, you know what? If that's what you've got to do to win a TT, you can keep it. I'll never do that. <laughs> yeah, seriously, honestly, yeah. Because mm. you must have been going. Because obviously you're competing with these lads at like world level, like you know, like Carl Fogarty going there and stuff like that. Did he just think that was well, impressive? Was one? Yeah, was. Yeah, not many people do that. No, 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 especially now, especially mm. now. So, so when you went over, was your mindset just to kind of finish the race? It's like not, not like you weren't bothered about being too competitive and then just, no. you just... My mindset was I was going to get on that ferry coming home in my own van. It's a very you know honest answer. I mean? No, no, it's uh -huh. right though, you know what I mean? It's yeah. You've got to have the right, you know, the ambition to do it, haven't you? So and then fair when, play to you though. A lot people, of people wouldn't even try it. So <laughs> when people asked in the future, are you going back? So did you say, oh, it's not for me and like just sort of avoided it the rest of your career? Yes, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't, there was no bravado that, oh, yeah, it's not for me, you know, I'd rather do short circuit. It was not for me because it would scare me to death. Yeah. You know, it was just, I just, uh, I just totally admire people that do the Isle of Man and doing like 130 odd mile an hour around there. Absolutely mind blowing. Yeah. But, you know. Did you, I know it's scared, it was scary, but did you get like a massive buzz out of it? Or oh, God, it? yeah. I mean, Honestly, if there's one race I could have won, I'd love to have won the senior or a TT race of anything. But um, it's what was the question? Sorry, like, did you get like a, a oh, buzz? buzz out of yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I'm saying what I wanted to do is I'd love to have won a TT, and I do get it that if you can get around there 130 mile an hour, like you have. It must be absolutely mind blowing to be able to go through corners at 160, 170 mile an hour. And having the commitment and knowing that actually it does go right when you think it's going to go right. Where when I was there, I was going into a corner. It it goes right, I think. But you, you know, when you're flat out, you can't think. You've got to know, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. It must be a mind blowing thing to do. I'd love it, but uh, I was never committed enough to uh, to go back and keep going. Uh -huh. Wow. Is there anything in your biking career that you wish you'd done that you regret not actually having to go at? No, Tracks wise, or you just feel like you? you no, take I think them I've, I've pretty well. Yeah, I've, that's brilliant. I've, I've, honestly, I've got no regrets of what I've done or what I haven't done. I don't yeah. think there's anything. I mean, Did, yes, it would have been great to have won a TT, 
I know what you've done the TT. I've done the TT. I wasn't prepared to do what you have to do to win. So, yeah. did you ever do the Northwest or Macau? No, I did Macau. Right. I did that in '89. <laughs> But yeah, that was mad. That is, is mad. Yeah. <laughs> Did you find that more dangerous than the TT or something? No, not really, because I wasn't racing the circuit. I was just riding it, you know? Right. Having said that, Roger, I think it was Roger Burnett, he was the man in charge. He was a senior sort of man who or rider back in the day. And uh, we all sat down and had a meeting. This was at Macau <laughs> before the race, and Whit Whitten was there and uh, a few others. And Roger said, he sat up on this stool and said, right then, lads, he said, Dangerous place, not a race. It's just an uh, exhibition. Yeah, yeah, like hell. Yeah, bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> first, uh, first lap, me and Wick got tangled up together, bouncing off bloody barriers. Oh, dear me. Uh, mad. Class. But, uh, yeah, it's good fun. Yeah. <laughs> It's right though, isn't it? It doesn't matter what you do. There's no such thing as expedition in, in motorcycle. No, but two not. blokes on a motorcycle, there's no, no. no. there's nothing parading about with, it. With big egos, no, it's not, is it, at all? <laughs> and in your, so we're kind of after your GP and your World Superbike era, back to, to what's now BSB. That started in, did it start being called a BSB in around 95-ish? Yeah, 96, I think. 96. 96 the first year. Which just coincided when you came back and... I mean, looking at the history books, there's only Shaky and Kianari that have had more race wins in in the whole championship in the history of the championship. All the all the riders, all the teams. There's also there's only Shaky that's had more podiums, and one of the most amazing stats is the out of all of the races you ever started, you finished on the podium more more times than you finished off the podium, which is like I don't know how many people can say that, but there's not many. No, there won't be no any it's more. bad, isn't it? But but you're on about the, uh, the the wins and things like that. It's probably because I did it for so many years. You know, I retired in 2005, so there's, there's a good eight years there worth of, of racing. So it's not eight years though. It's not a massive amount in the grand scheme of things, is it? It's not like um, well, if not... you if you'd sit me down now and say this is what you could have done, would you want to do it? I'll say yeah. You know, so yeah, I don't regret anything, and I think. Yeah, we did a pretty good job back in the day, and uh, we worked hard. But I had fantastic people around me, and I think I was very lucky to to do what I did and be where I was. Mm. So your first championship win in BSB was on the Ducati for mm -hmm. um, for Ben Ben Atkins, Red Bull Ducati, yeah. Yeah. Red Bull Ducati, yeah. And then talk us through your run us through your your BSB career. So started on that Ducati. Yeah, we we finished. I think fourth. We we, we were in the top five. All that time, but if we finished in uh, 2002, having won a World Superbike race on the on that bike, a wild card, uh, yeah, wild that must card have been that, that, must that have been was amazing. that was probably one of the highlights of my career. To be fair, after Troy Bailey myself myself had a, a cracking race, and uh, yeah, I managed to to beat him to the flag. So, do you know? Do you know when you sat at home now watching World Superbikes and you're watching them battle for the wins? Does it does it feel real that like mm. you've You've been there and you've done that. You know what it feels like. <laughs> I, I get it. Absolutely get it. And when they sat on the line, you know, I just know what they're going through. And oh, I just I wouldn't want to do it again. You know, <laughs> no, really, no, really, yeah. No, I just know what you've got to put your body through and yourself through and your mind through and the pain that you go through and everything else. And it's uh, fantastic when you're doing it. But you know, me being a bloke I am now. In the late fifties, you know. Do you not like how this week or next weekend uh, there's a few people from BSB doing wildcards? So Hickman's doing one. I think Mackenzie's yep. is doing one. The chances of of a BSB rider going out and winning a World Superbike race uh, as a wildcard is virtually it's not quite zero, but it's virtually zero in the dry conditions. Hmm. Like the fact that you've done it, done it back then, do you not find that just like mind blown? Uh, the, the difference is back in the day, the bikes we were racing in the in the British Superbike were identical to what they were using in World Superbike. I still think if they had, even if like I'm sure Taz Taz is on a full blown World Superbike right. bike, Yamaha mm -hmm. have built them, and I presume Hickman won't be riding his BSB bike. I presume that'll okay. be sort of World Superbike spec. Okay. But the chances of them, yeah, well that's it. But again, you've got traction control in World Superbike where you don't have that in BSB and mm. that, I would imagine that takes some getting used to I rode the, the MotoGP Suzuki back in the day around Brands Hatch and Bautista was riding for Suzuki at the time and uh, the first lap we came down Paddock Hill together up into Druids around Druids and then he just lit the thing up this is the first lap 
and just went. I thought, are they cold tyres? Well, they weren't cold, they'd been on tyre warmers, but new tyres. And uh, I got back in and I said, you know, obviously you did do, but how, how do you do it? What's that? He said, just believe in the bike. Traction control, he said, it's not going to do anything for you. You know, just, when you look at Motor, Motor GP now, there's never, or very, very rarely, any high sides, is there? Mm -hmm. unless something goes mechanically wrong. And if you remember, uh, can you remember when Marquez and Pedroza yes, touched each other? Exactly. It knocked a sensor. The rear sensor off the trial. And he high sided that corner. The which, soon, as soon as he tapped on the throttle, that was it. Side. Boom. Which goes to show how much they actually rely on the, yeah. on the traction. But to get the best out of the bike, you've got to be able to trust it. And yeah. I, I think it's going to be tough for anybody that's in BSB that's not used to it. To get out and get the best out of the bike. I get, I get what you're hard. saying. So if they were practicing on traction right. all the time, then fair enough. I it think would so. Have been more realistic chance. Maybe. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I think you're right. Not that the lesser riders. I think you know. I was about to ask that question. Do you think? Oh, it's so so I, I would class you your era as a truer form of racing solely because it was a bit. It was cabled to you know to the back to the back tire. No traction aids whatsoever. A bit more on the chassis side of things. But oh, just oh, everything so adapts and breathes, yeah. doesn't it? it it's so, you can't label that down as they're better than them and vice versa. Yeah. It's you just you just ride it to your max. Mm. So after the Red Bull Ducati days, so you um, did you say you were fourth in the first year and then won won the next year? No, I think we were, we didn't win. I, I started in ninety seven, and we didn't win till two thousand and two. So it was a, quite a big haul. And Ben Atkins and Red Bull and everybody else put in hundreds of thousands of pounds to try and get that win yeah. for the championship and we finally did uh, and then uh, that was it really I just got a sense that at the end of that year Ben was getting a bit uh, disillusioned with, with racing and uh, I could see that the questions I was asking Ben weren't the question, the answers I wanted as in commitment and stuff so in the meantime Paul Denning had uh, had a chat and uh, offered a chance to, to race the Suzuki for them for do, present. Do you know from the, the year that you won on the Ducati, have you got any special memorabilia or anything? Did you keep anything from that year? Well, I've got all the old uh, team clothing. Have you? Yeah. yeah. I never shook anything away. I've got the leathers and bits and pieces. I wish I'd kept a bike. But... I bet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'd be worth a few went. quid that now. Oh, they are. Yeah. <laughs> but, I think uh, those bikes were actually sold to Paul. Paul Bird and he ran them the, the following year oh, under his yeah mm -hmm. um, under his things and I think they had a bit of a disaster with them. Okay, uh, I know. I think IF, uh, IFC were uh, part of it. I think Ray Stringer was involved in a company that uh, wanted our bikes. Mm -hmm. I know two of them got stolen and got uh, yeah we got broke into and oh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was all good. I remember the I just won the championship on the on the Ducati. I think it was uh, Fast Bike Magazine or somebody came up with an idea. Said, "All right, because the new I was going to be riding the Suzuki the next year, we'll go to Rockingham, and you can have ten or fifteen laps on your Ducati, and then jump onto the bike that you're going to be riding next year, and you know we'll do a comparison, see what it is." So, of course, I, I rode the Ducati and just fit like a glove. You know, everything about it was just I just I, I sit I, part of that bike. You know. Anyway, I, I jumped off that onto the Suzuki that I was going to be riding, bearing in mind that the Ducati had got horsepower right from nothing all the way up to the top. Jumped on the Suzuki and there was no mid-range power. It was hard. It was just not the bike that I was, you know, I, I could ride. And I thought, oh, Christ, we're in trouble here. You know, obviously, I didn't say that to the magazine when I got off it, but um, that just goes to show that what we had with when the GSX-R first came out and how... Crescent Suzuki and uh, the team evolved to make that bike a race winning bike was, was something quite special and something I'm very proud of to be part of and uh, it was it was uh, a proper challenge it was mm. good and good. did you have like a 2003 to sort of learn the bike yes and then I'll tell, I tell you how I did as well because the first test we had was over in Spain and my teammate that year was Carl, Carl Harris and he just won the 600 Super Sport Championship and he'd been offered the chance to ride the, the Superbike. So anyway, he, he came over and he was the man that taught me how to ride this bike because there's no mid-range power. So with the Ducati back in the day, you'll come into the corner and then sit the bike up and then drive it out. But with the Suzuki with no mid-range, you had to get on the power as the thing was fully lent over so that hopefully when it was up there, it would come into its power band and go.
You said the word hope. <laughs> that's a hope. very yeah. yeah well, that's it. Hopefully yeah, well, it was there. That that's some right. With, without traction control, you know, yeah. you start winding the bike up on its side. You know, we know what's going to happen. Yeah, or could potentially happen. But yeah, so fair play to it was Carl. He was you know, a couple of seconds a lot quicker than me. But I I thought well if I'm going to get to master this bike, I'm going to have to swallow my pride and learn from a young lad. And uh, that's what I did. <laughs> Just took him behind him and then started working out. Hmm, if you do that and do that, and then it all comes together. But that was my biggest problem with the Suzuki when I first got on it was lack of power in the middle, in the mid range. So we, th the team worked on that to get a lot more mid range power. And then it, it came tractable and it became proper nice. It's a, again, it must have been cool watching that. Uh, that team as in like the Crescent team win the World Superbike Championship for the first year last year yeah. after all of those years and sort of working with it would, have been, it would have been nice to have been on a Suzuki but uh, I was one of the first people to congratulate Paul I gave him a call and uh, you know I just know what a quality team they are and you know they, they did it didn't they mm -hmm. uh, excellent job yeah because you're still heavily involved heavily involved with suzuki you, you've been I'm involved you've... with suzuki yes yeah. yeah. not as heavily as uh, i used to be i mean mm. i was part of the race team's effort that but, was it yeah. uh now i'm i'm a brand ambassador right so i still do bits and pieces for them and stuff so. very good but you got yeah. a brand new suzuki in the garage brand new track. good man uh, yeah. <laughs> and on the drive a happy day oh yes the car <laughs> as well there you go you've got to keep involved so you're not tempted to get like a bit more well, back into it, really, or are you just happy? If the chance came around that, you know, I could get involved, then I'd, I'd jump at it, to be yeah. fair. Yeah, I really would. But what I don't want to be is a hanger-on, somebody in the garage that's uh, not doing anything and people are questioning, what was he there for? Mm. And it actually, towards the end of when I was part of the race team with Suzuki, I was starting to feel that, you know, I'm, I'm not, I've got nothing to offer here. You know, I'm just standing around and... Okay, I'm watching what's happening and then going back and writing reports. But I'm, I got nearly to that sort of bloat that I used to think when I was racing, what's he doing in the garage? You know, why? Mm. What's. And I didn't want that. So I'm quite happy where I am at the moment now. <laughs> do you ever. Um, do you know, like, say, when you're at motorcycle shows and stuff, obviously a lot of people from that used to watch BSB in that era or be like, let's meet you and speak to you and stuff. When it got to the point of when there's, um, say, like younger riders coming through that didn't used to watch BSB and stuff, does it did it sort of get to a point where like they would, you almost want to say like, here's a DVD, go and watch. Like this is what I used to be able to do. No, no, I don't. But it is, uh, it is funny that you know I'm talking to riders nowadays. I haven't got a clue who I am, you know, and they weren't even born when I won the the championship. So you know you can't knock them for that. I mean. Back in my day, because when I was seven and eight year old, all my heroes were road racers, and I, I knew them all. You know, and you know, jumping and um, meeting John Cooper for the first time a few years ago. You know, is my hero back in the day. I was there the day at Mallory Park in like the late early seventies, maybe, when he beat Ago, and uh, I watched that race. And then to get to meet John Cooper and to be his friend, you know, it's, it's special. It really is. That's well, I tell you what, like you're talking about, like you know the the time change, and is there anyone you're watching now? In like, let's let's go through all the categories to be fair. So let's start with BSB, then Worlds, and MotoGP. Who was like your outstanding? He's the next thing in BSB. What in recent years? Right, like yeah, in today's championship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see uh, Bradley Ray. Right. I saw him honestly. I saw him. Uh, oh, God knows how many five eight years ago, maybe. Hmm. And he just stood out. He wasn't doing anything. You know, he was, I think, on a superbike for the first time. And he was wobbling around in, I don't know, 10th, 12th place. That was a Suzuki as well. Oh, it the was. Red. Yeah, yeah it the was. red one. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Him and Gwyntoli were teammates that year. Uh, right. Okay. I remember another guy, tall lad. So there was Gwyntoli and Brad on the red bikes. Yeah. And then on the bill base, on the uh, blue bikes back then, it was Taylor McKenzie and. Oh, who's Taylor's teammate that year? The tall lad. Oh. oh, I can't remember who was on that. Can you remember who was on that? I have a clue, mate. <laughs> I remember ta yeah. Taylor and somebody else were on okay. the factory bikes. But seeing Brad, 
I think I, I, there's just something about him. I thought he's, he's got it. Yeah, he's got a great chance of winning right. the championship this year. He's been, I don't think he's been off the podium once this no, year. No, uh, like mega consistent. Every track we we'll go to, he's um, he's bang on the pace, like riding, riding great. I mean, I was working with the race team when Brad came to uh, to ride the Suzuki for the first time. I think he did. He win the first three or four races that year. He did. He did yeah. a back to back at Donington. In Donington Park, yeah. Aye, and uh, I, I, I got straight on to everybody at Suzuki and said that this guy's pretty special, and I think we need to start, you know, looking after him a bit and often try and get him on a motor GP bike sometime soon. And uh, the thing is, he did the eight hour, and then that all knocked him for for six, I think, because. He, he was riding with, I think, Bridgestone tyres at the time, and then he came back to, would it be Pirelli? Yeah. Mm. And I think there's such a big difference. I think it just messed with his head, and mm. then jet lag got in, and, and uh, it messed his year up. But no, he's, he's, he's special. Mm. He did get a go on the MotoGP bike mm. that year, as well mm -hmm. as uh, Michael Dunlop did as well. Oh, right. God, so really it's really bugging us, the fact I can't remember that. It'll come to us mm. the, on that, the way home. That, that fourth rider, but yeah. Um, so... You signed for Paul Denon, and obviously a bit of a learning year, and then you won the championship in 2004. Uh, like I said, I remember great years, and uh, the likes of Key and Ari Michael, were, you were cheeky, um, Kagiyama, you were teammates with Kagiyama mm -hmm. there, then yeah. as well. What was, uh, he, I never really got to kind of know him or anything, or uh, what was he like? Well, Yukio? Yeah. Oh, he was, he was a good lad. He was, uh... was he a fun teammate to have, a nice, nice bloke? He was a nice bloke. Not not a fun mate to have. No, no. He was. Uh, <laughs> for instance, we're we're going for the championship. I got a good lead and a good chance of winning the championship. This was going into Mallory Park. Yukio had a an outside chance of winning, but he was asked to tow the corporate line and just you know not do anything stupid. Well, he tried his best to beat me that day, and uh, I remember going into the uh, the hairpin for the last time, and he. He came alongside me and he tried to make me force him into, into a mistake. I just remember coming out the corner and then just riding him to the white line. <laughs> and he didn't speak to me after that for, for quite a while. But uh, the thing with Yuki is uh, he had a birthday uh, party down south where, where he was living. He was living in the uh, pool, pool area, real nice part of the world. And uh, so Suzuki and Crescent decided to throw a party for him. So I was invited down and uh, I thought, what am I going to buy him for his for his birthday? I thought, I know what, I'll buy him a nice bottle of expensive whiskey. And he can take it back to Japan with him when he's finished and have a tot every Christmas or every birthday and just think of me, you know. So I presented him with the, the bottle of whiskey. Within half an hour, it had gone. A lot. <laughs> Never. <laughs> yeah. And then 15 minutes after that, he was running about the house naked with the German helmet on his head. Never. Oh, yeah. I've never seen anybody go from stone cold sober to absolutely red <laughs> in such a short period of time. It was just down the lot. Just every, oh, dear me. Yeah. He was a character, proper but character. Who's the best character? Who's been best, the best night out? You know what? I hated Sean Emmett, right, when I first started racing because he was riding for Fast Bike. Yeah. And he was writing about. We we're doing Grand Prix together, and it was he was the best thing since sliced bread, and he was slagging me off, and I flipping hated him. I really did. Anyway, it goes into Red Bull days, and then Ben Atkins announced to me, he said, "Oh, by the way, uh, next year Sean Emmett's going to be a teammate." I said, "No, no, you can't do that." I said, "I said I hate him." He said, "Well, tough, tough. <laughs> yeah. It's not your team. It's mine. I own it. You know, you're riding for me." Oh bloody hell! Anyway. Anyway, it turns out he became a best mate. Sean Emmett was the best fun you could ever have on a night out. It really, really? is. Yeah. He's mad. <laughs> Go on, how are you? You're smiling. What, oh, no, no, just, no, no, no. There mad. must be a no, mad no, story. Just, what, what's the uh, maddest thing he's done? This is your opportunity. <laughs> no, he's just done mad things. He chucked a television out of a bedroom window once. You're joking. No, I'm not. No. <laughs> Stood on the table and knocked a load of glasses over. This is the same night, this is. Yeah, he's just a rock star, isn't he? Do you keep in, keep in contact with him? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you keep in touch with many people? No, no really, no. I think <laughs> yeah. Neil, Neil McKenzie maybe is the one. Uh, and again, when we were racing, never spoke. You know, he didn't like me. I respected him. I didn't, you know, I, didn't, I wanted to be his mate, but he just wouldn't talk. So, uh, but you know, when he retired and then he started working for Suzuki and working with the team that I was riding for, 
we became great mates. And then when I retired, you know, the barriers, it's that barrier thing. You know, when you're racing, you've, you you don't make friends because they're not your mates. You know, the the people in your way to stop you winning, aren't they? That's how I looked at it. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Class. You know, you obviously mentioned the sort of positive side of when you had your crash and uh, you, you retired and you said you'd, ha- you'd been in that sort of pressure box for 20 odd years and all of the expectation and the uncertainty and that you almost felt like that relief. relief. Did you also find it difficult watching the race and not being part of it? Mm. Because it had been such a massive part of your life. Did you find that transition period difficult? Like sort of filling the gap? Yeah, well, <clears throat> Shaky Burn took my ride. And honestly, it was like when I saw him on the bike, my old girlfriend, you know, he'd, yeah. he'd gone with my old girlfriend and uh, it was heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really, good Wor- adventure. Uh, so worse than that, like you can get another girlfriend, but your bike's like... Mm. You know, <laughs> 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 yeah, I get it. <laughs> but yeah, and, and did you, you know, just stop watching the race? And no, no, I was still involved. I just had to swallow it and uh, just just get on with it, really, because that that's what it was. The, that's my new life now. Yeah, watching somebody Excellent. riding my ex girlfriend. Some sort of cuckold bit. <laughs> um, oh, class. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and did you go straight into a, a a position with Suzuki, as in like straight back into the team, but from a like racing coordinator point of view or something yes. like that yeah, it and then was, f- really. for years just sort of been involved from the other side of the the track in the mm-hmm. garage and then recently kind of um is it only the last few years you've actually stopped being at the racing yes and uh, i think covid i mean i'm a test rider mm-hmm. for suzuki as well not even now uh yes but we've not done anything since the last gsxr so this, the the last job i was supposed to be doing was with the high booster right but well, we've got all checked out when I was off to Germany to do the, the three week test out there and uh, then COVID came mm. and then that was it. It was just I've I've just been on the phone to Michael Rutter on the way down here chatting and I, I told him I was coming down to do this and he said I can't remember what year it was, but at some point he said he there was a new Jixxer came out and he got a chance to test ride it. Oh, you're talking Michael Rutter now, are you? Yeah. And he said he, he went out on this bike and he said it was unbelievably good. And he came back in and he said, whoever's worked on this and set it up. And they said, oh, it's John Reynolds. Mm. So uh, there's a compliment oh, it for is, you. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I think he did say if I'd have had this bike, he wouldn't have beat me as well, didn't he? <laughs> did he? <laughs> <laughs> Class. But, uh, Class. Yes, nice, nice fellow, Michael. Um, what do you sort of affiliate other than test riding now and again? and uh, like the role that you have with Suzuki what what else do you do to sort of fill your time these days Gordon really no I don't honestly it's uh, I'm retired really uh, Quite like a co- ch- you know what Covid came in and I got used to actually being at home and uh, I quite enjoy that now you know I've, I've got a couple of properties that we rent out and that keeps us busy doing bits and pieces um, so yeah, it's all good Nice. If you didn't become John Reynolds the bike racer, what could you see yourself doing? What as of that? Yeah. Do I, you still would have been a sign writer? I would. Yeah, I've been a sign writer. But you know what? It uh, it was just in the transitional period where I was sign writing. So bear in mind, we were, we're with people like Barrett's and Leach Holmes. So my job would be to get an eight by four sheet, get it painted, and then set it out, mark it out, and then uh, sign write it. And it was a work of art. You know, I loved it. And then the boss came along and said, oh, I've got a computer now. He said, uh, these things just cuts out of vinyl. And he'd, anyway, so he, he'd go home, he'd cut all the lettering up for this sign, whatever it was going to be that we're putting on. We'll peel all the backing tape off, put some application tape on, stick it, stick it to the boards, scrape it off, get any bubbles out. And that was it. I thought, well, a monkey can do this job, you know. So it sort of took the skill away from oh, it. Oh, well, it did. I mean, the computer's done that to a lot of jobs. I know that. But, yeah, uh, yeah it was uh, it was heartbreaking, really, when that happened. But So, yeah, I mean, I, w- I would have been a, a sign writer and just kept on going, and yeah. uh, I enjoyed it. Speaking of uh, sort of advances in technology, and obviously there's loads of jobs like that over the years that have been uh, computerised. The, the, the other day, have you ever had a chance to wear... A, do you know anything about virtual reality? Yeah, I do, but I've not yet. No, my son's on about it. We're yeah, on. well, when I was uh, teaching, a lot of the kids would talk about going home, and uh, I'd be if I was so. Oh, you doing anything nice tonight? Going out with your friends or whatever? And they would say, oh, I'm, 
I'll meet up with them in V, V, what is it, VR, virtual reality, yeah, <laughs> VR. And I'm like, oh, what's that all about? And I've never really understood it. One of my friends gave us a headset the other day. It's, it's terrifying. Is it? Yeah. Like what, where that's going to lead to and what kids are going to be doing. So what it's, could you be doing with it? Um, Anything. <laughs> basically, you put these goggles, you put these goggles on and it's just like being here. So like, say if someone put the goggles on, everything looks 3D. You f- Is it that virtual reality thing? That's it, yeah. You feel like you, you're somewhere else. And then basically you can do, so I only had a little go, but you went on a roller coaster and it was it was exactly the same sensations. You're looking around and it wow. just look, and then you're going with it. And uh, you can, if you want to say, if you you were in Nottingham, but somebody else was like in Newcastle, but you wanted to watch something together. You can both put the headset on and in virtual reality, you can, it feels like you're at a cinema, but you're next to them and you can chat to them okay. in a working environment. Like say if you needed to a meeting, but people are all around the world. If they all had the sets on, you're like, you, you could all be sat at the, the, I sat at a table talking and presenting stuff and whatever. Or it, it's mad. It's, but it, it's, it's terrifying. It's because I could well imagine. Because, mm. do you know, Meta, who own Facebook, right. they've got this vision of the Meta universe where everything, you can basically be what you want and who you want. You can dress how you like and you can have property in the Meta universe. <laughs> and it's basically, it's like, an, this is where the whole thing's gone, but you'll be able to basically do anything you want, like anything you want, see anything you want. But it's not it's, real life. It's no. ter- I'm exciting, not sure. but yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's good. It I'm more hands on sort of <laughs> doing it, you know? Yeah. But I remember, yeah, the first time we went to, uh, I think, Disney World or something, we went in this big dome. And again, it was like a roller coaster and it was all over around us and you could look around and see. So that's similar to that, I suppose, isn't it? Very early stages of that. Yeah. But it made me feel ill. Yeah. You know, because you've got the motion of going up and down, but you stood still and you're expecting to fall off a rock. And I'm, yeah, I'm very, uh, very scared about where it's kind of going and what, yeah, what the impact, especially for kids, because mm. uh, mm. th- there's like so, you no know, like social skills that you learn when you from actually being with people. That I think when you've when you're doing it online in an online environment where you can look however you want and stuff. It can't be good in the long run, mm. but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> maybe not the pot. Maybe so not the next the... time we have it on, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be at home with the, with the VR on, <laughs> and we'll be doing all this. So from saving, so saving the hassle and nicking your Saturday afternoon, we'll run something called a, a Patreon page, which is it's basically like a social media where people can ask questions and stuff for the podcast. So I'll just get you'll have some questions uh, on here. So I'll just have a quick check. Who's the most difficult? Ra- I'm going to ask you a question while they're doing that, <laughs> and I'll probably end up nicking one of their questions. Who was the one rider that you pulled up on next to the grid and went, "Oh God, not him"? Jim Moody. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like some time to think about that answer? <laughs> yeah. Really hard. Yeah, <laughs> God, it's hard as nails. And every time we tended to race with each other, we'd knock each other off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, where were we? Scarborough. Ended up going through a fence and down a banking because oh, me and Jim you. Moody hit each other. And guess what? The bloke I lined up with. At the Isle of Man, because he used to go two at a time, didn't yeah, I? Yeah. Jim Moody. Yeah. I didn't see much of him because he'd just gone. But yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you've done a fair bit of road racing then. Which like, Macau, Scarborough, TT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you do much at Scarborough? Was that like a popular Scar- thing? No, Scarborough was the last year that the it was actually a British Championship event. There. Ah, right. Yeah, I mean, mad. Because it, it was mad. That what? It's a footway yeah. to. <laughs> there's trailers wider than that, isn't uh, it? So it's. But, right, what else? What other road race have you done? No, that's it. The thing. Oh, there yeah. we are. I mean, yeah. Northwest was spoke about. Hmm. And Roger Marshall was my team manager at the time. And, uh, that would have been for Rebel Ducati. Well, he's a legend there, isn't oh, he? Oh, yeah. At the, the Northwest. So he said, uh, he said to me, Do you fancy doing it? I said, uh, No, not really. He said, Oh, come on. It's a piece of piss, he said. So this, this is how he spoke to me. He said, it's one straight hairpin, another straight <laughs> hairpin. It's a big triangle. So he said, let's go over. We'll go and watch it this year. So I went over and... Uh, Never got out the bar. Uh, well, yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> but now nah, I took one look at that. I thought, no, nah, no way. That, I mean, this is hard work. I mean, it's a proper nasty track, isn't it? Mm. Well, it could be. Well, mm. is there, yeah. mm. Mm. Ben, would you mind just opening the door to bit, just to let them freshen up? A bit warm. It's a bit warm. We're down south here, Chris. It's 10 degrees warmer. All the way down, Ben. There you go. Cheers, Ben. Um, right, so a few questions. A few Patreon questions. So, uh, first one is from Andy Hosking. And he says, including life outside of racing, what would you say was your greatest achievement? And if you could change anything and do it again, what would it be? Uh, phew. Biggest achievement, probably staying married. 
Uh, and that's a fair comment. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's a yeah. very fair comment. To the, to fair the comment. same girl that I, I went out with at school. So <laughs> that's that. I had a great son. Uh, I think uh, learning to fly a helicopter and uh, an airplane is probably yeah, that's cool. Because I think I would never be able to do that. Uh, you know, did, but, you, did you just go to a school to do that sort of thing, or was it a friend? Or well, actually, me and Steve it's Islock it's were doing it at the same time, the helicopter thing. Yeah. And he beat me to it. He got his uh, license first. Unfortunately, he got killed in one, didn't he? Yes, he yeah. yeah. So, uh, but anyway, yeah. So, uh, I, yeah, yeah. You have to do forty, a minimum of forty-five hours flying time, and then exams and everything else that uh, go with that. Uh, about twelve exams, I think. Plain. Yeah, I know. I know. That's what I thought. I thought I'm never going to do this, but you know what? If I'd have studied as hard at school as I did to learn to fly the helicopter, I could have been a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> is it difficult? Is it? <laughs> Hi. Well, it, it was for me. It yeah. was for me. I mean, just taking in information and uh, retaining it is uh, not the easiest thing for me. Yeah. Oh. And uh, yeah, it must be a hell of a hell of a thing. I have heard flying helicopters like much much harder than flying a plane. No. Well, the airplane flies itself. The helicopter relies on a pilot. Constantly yeah. balancing it, isn't it? Yeah. Wow. Make it sound like a flint flow on there. You know, uh, like, oh yeah, yeah. Totally, yeah totally <laughs> exactly well, what I've heard of, like a running thing on the podcast where we will always ask the guest uh, the the most embarrassing moment of the life have you got one that stands out of the life <laughs> i remember the best moment of my life right was winning the world superbike at brands Edge. the probably the most embarrassing was getting onto the podium and falling over slipping honestly fell flat on my arse yeah <laughs> couldn't believe it so uh, that was pretty embarrassing as you could well imagine i mean the grandstands were absolutely packed and uh, on champagne yeah. yeah. Who, who was on the podium with you? It had been Troy Bayliss and I think James Toseland, I think. Wow. Mm. And I bet them two are going, yes. Yeah. He's Pom fallen right on his ass. Yeah. Go you know on, Pommy Wanker came back out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jesse Mortimer, does it give you a bit of a buzz when you see a Rizzler rep jigsaw on the road? Like Chrissy, I grew up watching you and you, uh, you, uh, Yuki san, is it Yuki san? Is yeah. that what mm -hmm. Kagiyama used yeah. to be called? Um, and that sky blue was everywhere. Mm. What's your favorite BSB circuit that they no longer go to? So, the mm. first one about it must be well, I mean, it's a massive buzz. Yeah, you I still mean, see Rizzler stuff now, yeah, you do. Yeah, uh, still people still have people coming up and saying, you know, can you sign the bike and this, that, and the other. And it, yeah, and it's because I think there was 50 replicas. Uh, of the Rizla Suzuki actually done by Crescent and so there's a few of them about yeah it's a big bu big buzz yeah um, the the circuit that what well, I most liked that's no longer a BSB circuit I mean there's quite a few that you used to race on like sort of Rockingham Croft. Mondello Croft uh, can you think of any others did you ever do Pembury that wouldn't have been that Pembury. wouldn't have been on the calendar yeah, I did Pembury but it's never, I don't think it was ever a British Superbike no. uh, event yeah no I don't miss any of them to be fair <laughs> yeah. uh, Croft was uh <laughs> Do you feel like it's it's been a good, good move to get rid of all of them? Well, no, no it's not, never a good move. I mean, the, the more circuits you go to, the better it is because it uh, evens out the capability of the bikes and the teams for every different circumstance. Mm. But Rockingham was just very, very bumpy, um, I remember. Uh, we had two bikes and stolen from there as well. Right. Mm, Rizzler Suzuki's, not mine, they were Shaker's. And they got uh, ransomed and uh, we had to go and pay a big fine to get them back. So, not happy times there. Mm. Um, but uh, Mondello, yeah, good circuit. It was great to go over there to see, you know, the Irish crowd and everything. There was, uh, we had a couple of uh, good races there. And I think it would be great for oh, BSB. Be great. I think it'd be great to go back. Well, they were using the Asin at one time, weren't they? Yes, but still are. Asin? Oh, no, it's not on the calendar. Not on the calendar this, the no. calendar this year. No, no. since well, COVID. Well, they mm. were talking about making a new circuit, whether that whether there was going to be the circuit of Wales and there was going to be the circuit of Ireland. There was going to be, you know, the, there's always talks, isn't there, about putting a new circuit on. But hmm. where would you like to have a BSB race? Somewhere that's not on the calendar now. Anywhere in the world. The Isle of Man. If there was a circuit there, the Isle of Man, it'd be great, wouldn't it? Jerby. Sure. Well, the uh, little, there's a, there's well, one yeah, there, there could be. But I mean, if, if you made something like a brand's hatch at the Isle of Man, I mean, you, you could, yeah, you're right. it could never be sustainable, but. It'd be, it'd be great it'd be cool. for the festival, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Would be, wouldn't it? Uh, here's a question from Tony Rolls. <laughs> Welcome to the pod, John. Who was your hardest opponent in terms of overtaking and what was your favourite track? Favourite track would be Brands Hatch, although it ended my career. Um, the hardest opponent. Anybody that was beating me, really. I mean, the, the, 
I think James Hayden would be one of them, mm. to be fair, as a personality as well. So we had a big fallout uh, when he was riding for Red Bull. He was my teammate, or I was his teammate, whatever which way you look at it. And uh, I put a pass on him at Alton Park and uh, he, he didn't like it. And he fell out with me for a long, long time after that. Best of friends now, obviously, because we've, we've both finished racing and that. But yeah, James was a very, very hard taskmaster. He, was, he kept you honest all the time. <laughs> but then again, Yuki Okagiyama, to be fair, all of them are, aren't they? I mean, the first thing you want to do if you're in racing, as they always say, is beat your teammate. Because if he's beating you, then you're second fiddle, aren't you? So. You uh, Kianari was. Did he just come over when when you were sort of racing? He came over after Carl Harris moved on. Yeah, on so, the HM Plan bike. Yes. So, yeah, so, you you raced against him at the sort of start of his BS. Who Yuki was? Uh, Kianari. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and he was my teammate. He came over to to be my teammate. Right. Yeah, and there's also we are forgetting about. Uh, Who's a Spaniard? Spaniard. Greg, Greg, Greg Gregorio Gregor Olivier. Olivier. Right, he's a legend. He was my teammate uh, when Yukio fell off and broke something. I think it would probably be his hip when he, mm -hmm. he had the big crash at Cadwell. So uh, we were at Thruxton and Paul Denning said, uh, uh, Gregorio was coming over, he's going to be a teammate, but he's here to help you, you know, to, to look after you. So anyway, you're struggling in qualifying. So Paul said, can they just get behind you and qualify and just try and drag him up the field a bit? Anyway, I did. I don't think he out-qualified me, but he, he was next door to me on the on the grid, so we got onto the front row. And the uh, the second race, he, he was getting faster and faster. The second race uh, into the, the last corner as you're going into the chicane at the end of the straight, he went under Michael Rutter. Michael Rutter lifted up and in, went into me, hit my front brake, blocked it, Ended up crashing, massive crash, broke my collarbone. So that was, you know, Gregorio coming to help us, nearly finished our chances of winning the championship. But uh, yeah, he was he was a good rider, strong rider, hard rider. Mm. There's a lot of hard hard people then. Mm. Again, that's uh, the the sort of the thought of someone doing that these days. Like, imagine if after the first round. Bradley Way uh, had an accident and some guy from Spain came over that didn't know the tracks or anything and ended up winning the championship. It would, I imagine turning up at tracks like Knock Hill and Cargo for the first time and then being winning the championship that year. It was like, yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, last few questions. We've got one from Termu. Absolutely buzzing for this. JR was a bit of a hero for me when I was younger. His autobiography was great and always really loved the paintwork on his eyes as well. Insert helmet gag. My question for John, <laughs> when, everything, <laughs> when everything was always about promotion, promoting yourself and promoting brands, I always remember John was respectful and professional. Mm. Was that side of racing difficult or did you enjoy it as much as it appeared in the media? No, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, honestly... Uh, meeting people, I'm a, I'm a quiet sort of guy, quite reserved. You know, I don't put myself out there, but you know, people t take the time out to come and say hello. I love it. You know, it's great, and uh, I, I do enjoy that. And again, if people didn't want to talk to you, it's a reason. It's because either they don't like you, or it's because you're not worth talking to. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, people have got questions that they want to ask me. I'll talk all day long, you know, but uh, so no, I loved it. I loved, I loved pr promoting and presenting manufacturers to the best of my ability. And again, you know, with uh, the old Colin Wright saying, or Alec Wright, you know, if there's nothing good to say about the product, keep your mouth shut, basically. And uh, I've been fortunate enough in my career that I've not really had to do that that often because mm. all the products I've had have all been top quality and I like to surround myself with the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, have you got anything else to? Um, no, I think like honestly, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely cracking. Obviously, it's it's hot in here, so I think we're all looking forward to getting outside and getting a bit of fresh air in. But honestly, thank you so much for your time, and I really love this one. Really just, love this one. Just to wrap a few things up. So, um, do you want do you want to mention about next Monday? Nah, we'll leave nah. That. Um, bit of mystery there. there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that maybe on the next podcast, the one after. But uh, we've got a, the a Benes Track Day is coming up on the 27th of July. So if anyone's there, I, I, it was sold out, but I think there is a few spaces. So uh, if you can check the website if you would like to come on that. And uh, yeah, I think that's everything from me. Also, cool. uh, thanks very much for your time. I've really enjoyed coming on the podcast. I, uh, we didn't mention it at the start, but you've never sort of, you don't really 
know about the podcast or seen them. So hopefully um, after this, I'll send you a few good, good recommendations and you can maybe enjoy it in your spare time. But yeah, thanks very much for your time. A uh, massive thank you to our sponsors, Colchester Kawasaki and to all of our patrons. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up sometime soon. Thank you. So much. It's been great to see you both. Cheers, John. Cheers. Chasing the racing. Powered by Colchester Kawasaki, part of the Global Moto Group. We supply new Aprilla, Moto Guzzi, Vespa, Royal Enfield, Kawasaki, Sim, Mutt and Benelli motorcycles.